What we have today is almost no formal empires. We have lots of informal empires because powerful countries still try to dominate each other. When it comes to imperial legacies, proximity to history matters massively. Within living memory is, is obviously the most proximate, but also within generational memories, and my parents experienced this, matters too. The structural reasons and the post-imperial reasons around why Ukraine is and will be a war zone for the foreseeable future Ukrainians are suffering come down to foreign policy choices when you are located next to a pair of behemoths, NATO and Russia. Was it responsible to encourage NATO expansion with regards to Ukraine when the actual dynamics of the alliance politically meant that consensus to admit Ukraine was always elusive? Hello everyone, this is Maz. This is just a quick reminder that this is the last episode to be released before the Voices of War transitions to a subscription model in February. That means that apart from any public service type episodes that will be released in full, this channel would only publish the first half of each episode. To get the full episode, you will now need to subscribe to the Voices of War subscriber feed. You will find a link at the top of the show notes that provides more details, but in summary, you can already subscribe now at a cost of four US dollars per month. The link to the subscriber page is also in the show notes. Those who wish to support the show with a higher amount have a number of additional options. Importantly, if paying the subscription is simply outside of your budget right now, please email me as I have an alternate offer. Also, a reminder that educational institutions that may wish to use any of the future episodes need only email me and I'll make any of them available for your use free of charge. Okay, now let's go to my chat with Dr. Sami Puri for a deep dive on the impact of empires of the past on today's geopolitics. I don't say this lightly, but having recently read two of Sami's books, I think this has been one of the most influential conversations I've had to date. Understanding how our pasts shape our present is critical if we are to find enduring solutions to our many geopolitical, regional and interstate conflicts. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I have. My guest today is Dr. Samir Puri, who is a visiting lecturer in war studies at King's College London and who has previously taught at Cambridge and John Hopkins. He joins me today for a deep dive into his two most recent books. The first one, The Great Imperial Hangover, How Empires Have Shaped the World, explores how empires of the past still influence geopolitics today. And the second one, Russia's Road to War with Ukraine, Invasion Amidst the Ashes of Empires, published in late August, explores the role of imperialism in Putin's ultimate decision to invade Ukraine and traces Ukraine's fate as a nation caught in a geopolitical tug of war between Russia and the West. Apart from his academic life, Samir has served as an international observer at five Ukrainian elections, including during the Orange Revolution in 2004. Soon after the first Donbass war began in 2014, he spent a year in East Ukraine working on both sides of the front lines as part of an international ceasefire monitoring mission. Since Russia's latest invasion of Ukraine, Samir's analysis of the war has been featured by the BBC, Al Jazeera, Bloomberg, CNN, The Wall Street Journal, and other media outlets. Samir, thank you very much for joining me on The Voices of War. Uh, Great to be here. Uh, Really pleased. Looking forward to the conversation. So uh, before we get to the dense subject of empires and their residual influences, maybe we can get a sense of what motivated your journey into the study of international relations in the first instance, uh, and then in particular, the subject of empires. So I think sometimes we're not really conscious of what motivates us in our choices, especially when we're in our teens and picking choices of mm. universities mm-hmm. and first careers. But I've put the story together belatedly, and it's very simply, it's it's your inherited family background and, and who you are. So, I mean, my family's Indian, but from mm. the 1930s, and my parents were born in East Africa, Kenya, Tanzania. Mm. So that's a second continent. And I was born in the 80s in London. Hmm. And eventually you put these stories together because like a lot of migration focused families, we're very much future focused. No one really goes, let's trace the family tree. Yeah. Well, how did we end up covering three continents? Well, it's the British Empire. Yeah. And you can tell from my accent that that's, that's kind of the, the outcome mm. is off I, off I go uh, to university in the UK and no one asks any questions about your heritage. Uh, but when you put it together, you realize empires have really made 
not only the world go around, but they've also shaped the, the countries that we live in. Mm. That plus probably a similar theme to, to many people listening and, and to yourself, there's always a fascination with war as well. And that comes from, from a variety of places. And I ended up working in the UK Foreign Office for six years. And that's how I ended up uh, working in, in East Ukraine. So, so the books are really an outcome of professional and personal experiences, mm. putting it all together. I didn't want to write an academic book, which is sort of an encyclopedia. I'm not going to write a biography. You know, I'm not that important or that interesting in, in my own right. But putting the two together, mm. my lived experiences through migration, through family history, through the war in Ukraine with these bigger topics, bang. And then you've got, I think, something that's, uh, that's quite unique and, and a different way of conveying that information. Absolutely. And and having read both of these books just recently, uh, The Great Imperial Hangover First and then Russia's Road to uh, War with Ukraine Second, I can certainly attest to you having achieved that because they are, and this is something you and I talked about just before we started recording, this is such a huge subject and, and such a dense subject. Uh, but what you've done is you've walked us effectively a history through a history lesson uh, but made it relevant to today uh, and I think that's what, that's what really sparked my interest in this conversation because I think we often forget the role history has on today we view the world through the eyes of today uh, and most of us haven't been around uh, when these empires existed when they fell and don't really think about the residual impact they have on our everyday um but do you then also spend some time working in Ukraine? So, and, I, and I don't think that was uh, that was part of the as, as part of the OSCE. Uh, so, what? Why did you do that uh, in the first place? And then, what was that experience like uh, spending some time in Ukraine? Yeah, well, that's a great place to start because uh, the end of the USSR is probably the end of the world of formal empires. Mm, mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, we'll talk about imperialism a bit later mm-hmm. on. But with regards to to Ukraine, I chanced on uh, the uh, the opportunity to be an election observer in 2004. I was in my early 20s and it's one of those jobs that yeah. came out of nowhere uh, from someone I met uh, a, a drinks do. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, nothing. I've just finished university. I've got a degree in war studies. Funnily enough, I'm, I'm not, I don't think I'm that employable. So what do you do to him? He said, I'm, I, I'm an election observer and I recruit British election observers to mm. missions run by the UN, EU and OSCE, as we mentioned, mm. which covers Eastern Europe. Mm. So that's how I ended up there in 2004. And, um, fast forward 10 years when I was in the foreign office and the war in Ukraine broke out, I volunteered for this civilian observation mission, and it was meant to be verifying a ceasefire, which some listeners will be aware of. is called the Minsk Minsk Accord, mm-hmm. negotiated in Belarus, mediated by the OSCE, in fact, uh, at the working level. And uh, it involved driving around in these up-armoured Land Rovers to deliver patrol reports on how well the ceasefire was being stuck to or not. Mm. Now, we weren't soldiers. Lots of my colleagues were ex-soldiers, and the verification of break breaches of the ceasefire was quite rudimentary. It was, I can hear loud bang. So let's drive mm. the other way to get away from them. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I've yeah. got lots of colleagues on that you mission. You did a lot of driving, I'd imagine. <laughs> yeah, right. And uh, yeah. lots of lots of colleagues with, you know, very finely trained ears. Now, that's that's a mortar. That's 155 millimeter howitzer. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. That's MLRS. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a Smirsh rocket. All these things that you then document and obviously would visually identify the presence of armoured vehicles, uh, maybe in breach of what the two parties are signed up to doing. Do some human humanitarian patrolling as well around the, the degradation of the Donbass of living standards. Now, let me bring all that to, to a couple of takeaways, mm-hmm. which I think are really relevant for today. Firstly, your question about the, the sort of overhang of empire, the hangover, of course, mm-hmm. as I call it. Oh, I mean, this was, this is a post imperial war that's happening in 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 ukraine in 2014-15 when i was there and today in 2022 mm-hmm. uh, delusions of empire around rebuilding not only the soviet but also the czarist empires and how mm-hmm. they mm-hmm. had their hold over eastern ukraine but the second thing that i'd say is it's been going on for a very long time it's seven eight nine years ago that, that i was there for the year and when i came back to to the uk and i, I switched profession i became a lecturer in king's in london no one had heard of the donbass mm. As a, people, why did you go to the Donbass? What's the Donbass yeah. now? Arguably, if you know, you believe the media, the fate of many geopolitical themes are being decided in the Donbass and in southern Ukraine. Mm. And I think it's just a real, it's a real proof uh, that lots of the themes that, that some people thought were no longer relevant in the world today 
in this case, wars of imperial conquest, but also psychologically how histories of empire mould and shape statesmen and populations. If you can't get your head around those themes, you cannot understand Russia's motivations for doing this. Yeah. I'm not saying I agree with it. I condemn it from the, you know, the highest of rooftops with the loudest of voices, mm-hmm. as, I, as mm-hmm. I do in the book. But I think you caricature Russian and Putin's motivations at your peril. You have mm. to understand them. You can only understand them through the prism of, of empire. And that's a, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a wonderful introduction to what we're going to talk about because I think that's one of our greatest failings, as I alluded to. We look at history through the lens of today. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a, that's risky, especially when you're trying to find ways out of particular crises, whether this one or any, any one in, you know, recent memory. Uh, before we go any further, how do you define empire? And maybe you can touch on what role empires have played in the, kind of macro level human development story. Yeah, that as you said, it's a huge topic. And this is why I wrote The Great Imperial Hangover is to walk readers through this massive topic mm. in quite a comprehensible way. So, you know, the history of the world is inseparable from the history of empires. And those of you who, who've read the Old Testament will know that there are empires in the Old Testament that feature. Mm. Eventually, the Roman Empire features in the New Testament. Uh, and from that point and from recorded human history, you know, the world has passed through these phases of these ancient empires, then these monotheistic empires, the empires of Islam and Christianity, uh, across Russia, the steppe empires, land-based empires like the Mughals and the Ottomans in, mm. in, in India mm-hmm. and Turkey, respectively. Then the ones that really, I think, resonate if you're Australian or British, the maritime colonial empires, mm. mm-hmm. all the way from Sir Francis Drake, James Cook, yeah. All the way to, you know, the handover of Hong Kong in 1997. That was ultimately war booty from the opium wars of yeah. the 19th century that was then handed back to, to China. Now, the thing that I would uh, say in terms of def- definition is that you can see with these different types of empires, they have different shapes, different ways of functioning, cover different geographical stretches. But the big distinction in the academic literature, which, which I use is between formal and informal mm-hmm. empires. Mm-hmm. So let me just run run that yes, please. Yeah. Uh, as a sort of definition to to get us all on the same page. Formal empire involves conquest, occupation, displacing the locals, subjugating the locals, something along those lines. Mm-hmm. And something like the British Empire used that, and it also used informal networks as well, where you leave locals in charge, but you sort of dominate them, you control their economies, you control the trading links. What we have today is almost no formal empires – we have lots of informal empires because powerful countries still try to dominate each other, again, as I say, by having a controlling or veto stake in their local politics, certainly their economies, mm. maybe their defense arrangements because foreign basing is a thing that gives them security. Whether you call that empire or not is, I think, a matter of taste. Uh, but two two more observations on this to, to sort of round off this answer. Uh, the first is the move to informal empires. There's a couple of aberrations still today. For example, the Russian attempt to formally annex mm. territory in, in East Ukraine. But the reason that that really makes us sit up, take notice, is what Russia is doing today is so untypical today. Mm. Wars of imperial conquest do not happen. That's why the default mode today is informal empire. Mm. And I talk a lot about how the U.S., has many traits of informal empire. The second thing to say is there'll be listeners saying, well, what about China? What about the Uyghurs? What about Russia itself? Well, what you also have is lots of large modern states that are former empires now transformed into states. Mm -hmm. That's the reason that China, Russia, and the USA are as large as they are, Mm -hmm. is because at some point, probably in the 19th century, They expanded and conquered large chunks of territory. Now, they call themselves the USA, China, and Russian Federation. They're empires in disguise. They don't call themselves that. Mm. And Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any equivalence between how the US manages Texas versus how China manages the Uyghurs in Xinjiang province. Mm -hmm. There's Mm -hmm. no equivalent at all. You know, choice, free choice, for example, of this union is a big distinguisher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the fact they were conquered and the fact they were brought in to the mainstream through settler colonialism in you know, not in re- recent memory, but mm. in history, but not too distant either. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and that's that's also why the legacies of empires pervade so much, if not everything, of the politics of these countries, the way they come across, and when they accuse each other of hypocrisy, mm. uh, there are all sorts of things. You know, the U.S. will talk about the Uyghurs. 
to China, but China will then point out that your African American population, the descendants of slaves, are still low on the socioeconomic pecking order. Mm, mm. Another legacy of empire that's being sort of flung back in the. So you can see how it shapes modern discourse, and that's the point of the book. It's not a history book for the sake of history, like you're saying. It's mm. about how does that history form the substance of international disputes today. Yeah. Is it fair to say then that, um, and I'm just going to kind of generalize here, that the West is broadly Anglo Saxon? broadly white, never mind the fact that uh, much like yourself and probably me, uh, you know, we've gone to the centers of various empires for our own reasons, uh, uh, but it was kind of the, the, the pull of the empire. Is it fair to say that the Western empire doesn't really understand what the rest of the world is feeling because it's been on the kind of winning side, for lack of a better word, yeah. for the past better part of two, maybe even three centuries? Yeah, uh, completely. And this is one of the most important themes in the world today is how do you encourage Western self-awareness mm. around the West's own historical origins? And as you rightly point out, how the West is perceived in non-Western, non-English speaking. Yeah. And, and just to put in there, just w without falling for the far left trap of uh, white man's guilt and, and, and going into the extremes, but, but having a genuine conversation about this. Exactly. And that's the thing is like, you know, I'm not, you know, so a far left wing, mm. the West is imperial. That's yeah. Right. I'm, I'm oppressed because I'm not white. Not at all. No, I think, you know, I've loved growing up in the UK. The yeah. opportunities yeah. Yeah. have afforded me. And by Sorry. the way, yeah. you know, prime minister of the UK is a man with the same sort of ethnic and mm. sort of continental background as me, Rishi mm. Sunak. So, mm. Mm. you know, that's never going to happen in China. At no point am I going to tell you that the that's Western right. world is somehow the causes of all the world's evils. Yeah, right. But what I am going to say, and this echoes the way you, you phrase the question very well, is that because Western supremacy is now pretty much under Pax Americana, has been since the post-Cold War mm -hmm. uh, and certainly the post-World War II period, you know, the US has now slipped from being what I call the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world to the disputed heavyweight champion of the world. Mm. And we're moving into a position that it's not exclusively challenged by China, it's actually challenged by the diffusion of global power and influence to many sources of international mm. uh, civilizational culture and international influence. You just need to look no further than India's independent reaction to the war in Ukraine mm. to realize that not only India, but also Saudi Arabia refusing to uh, abide by the request to increase oil production through yeah. OPEC yeah. Also, and Turkey as well, you know, still maintaining links with Russia. There is a, a change in, in the air uh, and you can, you can sort of, you can taste it. It's so different to 1991 when the US corralled a, a, a global coalition to fight the Iraqis and mm, kick them mm. out of Kuwait, mm. where actually the US was the arbiter of, of global moralism and it was relatively un unquestioned. Mm. Uh, the US's soft power has taken a massive hit under Trump, which is an issue everyone understands very, very easily. Yeah. But the hard power uh, and the hard sort of economic realities of the US being less singularly dominant means that we will, when it comes to imperial history, have to start acquainting ourselves to a variety of contradictory interpretations about Western moral superiority, origins of Western power, and the rights to perpetuate un undisputed Western power. Mm, yeah, I guess that's one of those things that, again, is not really addressed and it's not something we dare to address because, you know, if you dare to question the moral righteousness uh, of Pax Americana, uh, you're falling for the, you're exposing yourself to, you know, being thrown into a radical camp or into being into a far left camp, uh, which is not at all what this is all about. This is about a, a genuine reflection of how history shapes today and how relationships that exist between global powers uh, are shaped by that history. Uh, and again, if we don't understand it, um, especially uh, with China, China's rise, um, and I guess the US. Is it fair to say U.S. demise, or is it, um, or is it a leveling of the playing field? It seems like a leveling. It's, it's a readjustment, in effect. And uh, you know, some of the sort of harder writers on these topics, like Kishore Mahbubani mm. uh, and others, uh, they say that the historical norm was of, of Indian and Chinese economic uh, dominance of the glo global economy until a couple of hundred years ago. Whether that's true or not, especially given the fact India didn't exist in a unified form mm, yeah. in, in, to the same extent until really the, the Marathis under uh, a leader called Shivaji started to, to actually conquer larger chunks of it. And of course, it was then Mughal dominated. Mm. So you can't have that same equivalent, say, India from two, three hundred years ago is the same India today. But I think the point they're making is, is, is I think, a very, very general point, which is you've gone from a, a point at which around the 1800s, the world tipped – 
decisively in favour of European than Euro-American dominion to a point at which it's tipping back. Mm. And I would say that most inhabitants of this planet are intellectually under-equipped to be able to think through the implications of this, to conceptualise what this will look like, to understand how their nations will comport themselves differently in in the very near future. Mm, mm, And that's, of course, where the risk of war creeps in. That's where the risk of of opportunists like Putin, who tried to grab something because he estimated that the West is more diminished than it actually is. Mm. Uh, He sort of steps in and launches this catastrophic war. Uh, That's where sort of the US hawks, uh, uh, you know, they're saying that China is, is aggressive. They're saying it's expansionist. What you need to read behind that is that the US hawks are suffering from status anxiety, mm. where the world in which they have become habituated into, which is that the USA is number one, looks like it might be challenged. And there's no mental framework to, I think, process what that actually means to you as a person, as, as someone who, as, you know, especially if you're a writer, if you're a statesman, if you embody these principles on the global stage, if you have a voice, uh, or frankly, even if you're just an ordinary person talking mm. about it to, to your friends and family, what does it mean to be yeah. in a world in which yeah. the West's word will not necessarily be, be taken at face value, but also that it's, it's moral authority and its actual physical ability to affect change in all corners of the world will diminish. And that mm. mean, that, that obviously leads to a necessity of compromise. But as you see now, what the West is trying to do is to still trying to belatedly shape the world as much as it possibly can in its own image and then fail to understand the world when it doesn't really uh, bend in that particular direction. Yeah. How much does empire have to do with, and, and the history of empire, have to do with identity and one's idea and relationship to one's past and one's lineage? Uh, because, and, and the reason I ask that is because it strikes me is that that's a key feature of what you just said is that, you know, it's, it's how, we, how we negotiate our place in the world which is really all about, you know, how the rest of the world sees me, uh, but also how I see myself, uh, which to me really screams of, of, of one's identity uh, and I guess one's uh, self-definition and place in the world. Yeah. Um, and that's a key theme of my book is when you're doing sort of imperial legacy work, especially comparative in different regions and each chapter mm. looks at a different region or, or yeah. former empire. Yeah. Uh, how do you capture those legacies? So one bit is the physical legacy. So the composition of population, shape of borders. The other is the attitudinal legacy. And that's uh, what you're getting at with this question. And that's our sort of national instincts, our sort of compulsions, the antecedents we've got mm. about when our, our forebears were, were just or unjust, when they were treated well, when they were treated badly. And, you know, some of these, some of these, I guess, superiority complexes that mm. might arise, some of these instincts for vengeance that yeah. might arise. Yeah. And, and the final point, which I think is really, really, you know, relevant to, you know, I'm, I'm a Brit, you're sitting in Australia, where in the world do you locate other people like you, your kin? Mm. That's a huge thing uh, that is a, an outcome of, of conquest of settlers who've, who've moved from one part of the world to the other. And, and I'm not trying to seek equivalence here, but I'm just looking at this thematically. When you look again at the Donbass, you're looking there at Russians who were settled in the Donbass to work in the mining industry a couple mm. of hundred years ago, who after imperial collapse have ended up in a different state. Ukraine mm. versus Russia. Mm. And this is east east of Ukraine in particular. So there you've got this bizarre, bloodthirsty moral legitimacy coming from the Kremlin saying these are people like us that we need to save. Now, I can tell you for first hand that not a lot of them don't want to be saved, quote mm. unquote. They're quite happy being Ukrainian. Mm. But then a million of them have fled to Russia as mm. refugees. It's not mm. only Poland and Hungary and Britain. Uh, and the Western European countries getting Ukrainian refugees, mm, mm. over a million have fled to Russia because mm. they do identify with Russia. Yeah, yeah. That's where the complexity sort of arises that we've, we've chopped the world up into these nation states after the end of empire. But, uh, you know, the world is messy and uh, in terms of its psychological and attitudinal connections mm, mm. because of the preceding chapters of imperial history that I, yeah. that I tried to compress and go through in, a, in as comprehensible way because I think you do need a bit of a roadmap because you know, you know, it's like layers of plywood, isn't it? Yeah. When you think about national histories, more layers just keep getting added on, but the previous ones don't disappear. That's right, uh, and that becomes a structural foundation of this, both the physical and psychological 
composition of of your country yeah of, of that imagined community and I, and I and as you were talking i keep getting and i just wrote down of benedict anderson's book uh, imagined communities it just keeps echoing as you're as you're talking because that seems to feature quite a lot in our narratives of ourselves is you know no nation in the world no social group in the world is preordained to exist it only exists because well, we give it meaning, we give it a name, we give it a flag, we give it a territory, uh, and therefore it becomes an imagined community. It's imagined by the people who uh, embrace its existence. Uh, and, you know, that that narrative is constantly in contest with the narratives of other social groups, of other imagined communities, uh, and those borders. And, and uh, as you and I talked about, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm from Bosnia, uh, a, a country that's experienced perhaps not at the scale, but something very similar to what Ukraine is experiencing now, uh, and yeah. that is a, 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 an extremely violent and brutal war, ethnic cleansing, uh, movement of people, uh, annexation effectively, although indirectly by regional powers. And that is all, uh, uh, you know, in 100 years' time, those regions that are you know, now under contestation might fully well be justified to, you know, have a flag of one or the other, uh, given on uh, on the outcome of, I guess, today's challenges, today's wars. Uh, you know, 100 years from now, it'll just be history. It'll just be part of that. It'll be one of those plywoods uh, that, you, that you're saying, one of those layers uh, that will create the narrative uh, of that particular social group. Yeah, and one quick reflection on, yeah. on Ukraine in particular. Obviously, it's happening now. It's really disturbing. It's horrendous. Mm. Uh, and it's beyond the pale. It is also quite a typical post-imperial war. And I think we are in danger of what I call Ukraine exceptionalism, where mm-hmm. it is like this great autocracy versus democracy battle. Mm. The you know, moral principles are at stake. You know, the, the Russian regime is like, you know, unquestionably an aberration of human history. No, not at all. And in, in the Russia's Road to War book, the analogy I actually draw mm. at the end is with the Turkish invasion of Cyprus in 1974. Mm. 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 Again, at the end of the British Empire, I won't go through the history uh, in detail. I'll simply say this. The Turks invaded. They managed to capture a third. They probably wanted all of it. And we've lived with that division in Europe uh, for over, you know, 40, 45, 50, coming to 50 years. Yeah. yeah. And I, I'm, I would not be surprised if in 30, 40, 50 years, we're talking about some sort of de facto, if not de jure, partition of mm. Ukraine mm. on the mm. basis of conflicting post-imperial visions as to, as to ownership, kinship, as well as strategic significance of, of, of a place, then, you know, the Turks and the, and the Russians, you know, for better or for worse, have yeah. at least one similarity is they both used to run <laughs> massive empires, mm, mm. Tsarist and Soviet for the, for the Russians, Ottoman clearly for the, for the, the, the forebears of, of the current Turks. Yeah. And, and I would say that that is a good, I think, thought to keep in mind when you think about the scratch that can't be itched of once having run grand empires for the forebears how do you scratch how do you live up to the past of the fact that you were once a great imperial power yeah and that maybe in the 20th century certainly russia and uh and turkey will have felt like losers mm. at some point and there's a lot of pride that can be unrequited that comes with that yeah that manifests very differently nothing is preordained and, and that's i guess the health warning here is the way I do it in the Imperial Hangover book is the uniqueness of that journey for, for the different major parts of the world. Mm. But the fact that there is a journey, the fact there's a start point, and it brings us to to where we are today with massive psychological hang-ups, mm. as well as practical problems that some countries might might perceive in their strategic environments. Again, yeah. it's the substance of disputes and wars between countries. Yeah, that's wonderful. And that is that is wonderful and so nuanced. I'll just be careful not to quote you on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Lest both you and I be cancelled, uh, because you know how dare you, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> suggest uh, that uh, Ukraine down the line at some point there might be some contested regions. Um, and I say that uh, tongue in cheek. Of course, I, I, I'm wholeheartedly in agreement with you uh, that nothing can justify uh, what Putin is doing in Ukraine at the moment uh, and the war crimes that are ongoing, uh, etc. And by all accounts, uh, you know, I'm, I've been very public about this. I, I certainly wish uh, and and exclaim loudly the Ukraine is, reserves its right to defend itself and retake all its territories. Uh, whether that actually happens or not, that's a different debate. And I think that's the point yeah. uh, you're trying to highlight, uh, that we can't be caught by the simplicity of the narrative when the situation on the ground and the reality on the ground is something vastly, vastly different. Just before we get into... Oh, sorry, did you want to you want to say something? I was, I was going to just very wholeheartedly chime in around Twitter. Is I mean, Twitter, you know, uh, 
don't forget to read a good book. That's what I always say, yes. because Twitter has a horrible way of oversimplifying things. And mm. it's, you know, it's a well-known tool in information warfare, especially for Western populations. There are other platforms that, you know, other language groups necessarily use, but certainly for mm. the English language, yeah. uh, oversimplification is, is, is Twitter's modus operandi. Mm. And, uh, and with regards to, to Russia, Ukraine, I'm not making a judgment about the rights and wrongs of it. You know, Ukraine deserves exactly as you say, deserves to defend itself, deserves its sovereignty. But remember this irony, which is that yes, Ukraine is fighting to kick out the Russian invaders and to banish its Soviet influences. That's imperial influence of the Soviet empire mm. in Ukraine. Intact Ukraine from 1991 is the same border as the Soviet Socialist Republic of Ukraine, the mm. administrative border within the USSR. There is no way Ukraine is going to emerge from this war with its borders unchallenged, unchanged. Mm. It is not going to get back all of its territory. And psychologically, I think, you know, there's, uh, it's now a case of how quickly people move to understanding what that is. Once the cycles of fighting start to peter out, once Ukraine's deoccupation potential, as I call it, is exhausted. Yeah. There's one thing that I want to pick, pick up on, and, and then I definitely want to return uh, to Ukraine proper in the, the, the Ukraine book or Russia's invasion uh, of Ukraine book. And that's that uh, you, you made mention about the, the kind of uh, historical legacy and, and even, you know, hatred and animosity and uh, that that's kind of deeply infused in this idea of empire and history and these multitudes of layers that exist. Yeah. But oftentimes, and, and I get this again as I, as I, as I, uh, alluded to before this kind of superiority complex by the West, who've been broadly been the the victors, so to speak, for the for the better part of uh, the last couple of centuries. Th there is this idea that you know that the son should not pay for the sins of the father, and let's can't we all just move on? Yeah, which to me misses the density and context of history that's so deeply embedded in those who've been wrongly done by. And I wonder, what do you say to those people? And I'm sure you've come across them who say, you know, the son should not pay for the sins of the father. Yeah, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, to an extent, current, current generations, they can't be held accountable for, for actions that their grandfathers and grandparents mm -hmm. took part in. I mean, yeah. that would be absurd. It's exactly. not practical. Yeah. Having said that, we are all descendants of, of empire. And the point I make in the book is that, you know, either our forebears were probably on this, the beneficiaries or active empire builders, mm. especially in Western countries, yeah. or, or whether the grandchildren, great grandchildren of people who were subjugated by empire. Mm. Mm -hmm. And certainly that's, that's my experience. Now, you know, my family were not slaves. So we have to put this in proportion here, but certainly my, my wider family, they always have a love hate relationship mm. with, with a certain type of elite Britishness because the elite Britishness is very, has been very unreflective around these themes, mm, mm -hmm. around asking these difficult questions. And I don't think for one minute a country like Britain or a country like Australia should sort of, you know, self-flagellate to the point of, of, you know, domestic collapse over beating itself up over the past. But I think because the dominant voices have been basically the white majority population's voices for many, many decades, it's actually quite belated that there is a catch up debate in the UK and Australia, whether it's Aboriginal culture and how it's represented and, and been suppressed in Australia, in Britain, whether it's, you know, black and, and, uh, black Britons and Asian Britons and others whose mm. voices haven't been reflected. Uh, just before I, I moved to Singapore, I was asked by uh, someone in number 10 Downing Street who they were writing a, a race commission report into ethnic disparity. I was asked to, as an author, an independent uh, contributor, to write a paper on how Britain can reconcile its imperial legacies with its oh, current wow. path. And, and, and obviously, I, I, I did strike that middle ground, which is I didn't think that the, the Black Lives Matter radical end yeah. of, of the argument was going to serve anyone very well, because it basically brings people up uh, from ethnic minority populations to arguably have a ready-made, I have been victimised, yeah. I have always been victimised, I've got nowhere to go argument. Yes. Clearly, you can't also go down, and I don't mean to take his name since he's now departed, there's a Duke of Edinburgh route where mm. he was sort of legendary for his, I guess, white majoritarian kind of mm. racist view of, mm. of, of people who travel around the Commonwealth and sort of kind of laughing at people's expenses because they just weren't sort of posh and European mm. like he was, mm. which, you know, that's it within living memory too. But as we move forward, this is where countries like the UK and Australia prove their worth as mature democracies they refresh their national stories, their national narratives, their inclusivity to move themselves forward. And certainly Britain with Rishi Sunak has, has made a big mm, statement in that. Yeah. He may be a Tory, he's a millionaire, so be it. But nonetheless, yeah. 
it's the a optics, big statement yeah, to show right, huge, to yeah. show yeah, yeah to show yeah. the rest of the world as well that you know this is not the 1960s 70s and 80s in terms of ex- expecting sort of that superiority complex to mm. to be able to fly mm. it won't fly mm. but i think it's it's about very careful balance and every post imperial country has to strike this balance carefully final thought on this should make us very pleased to live in democracies where you have freedom of thought the ability to challenge mm. china Russia, to an extent Turkey as well, yeah. um, critical voices around historical interpretation, they don't really exist. And, and that is, that's another issue. And that's ultimately why, you know, lots of people in the West are saying, well, we will be able to modernize ourselves to be more competitive, to appeal positively to the rest of the world. Yes, okay, perhaps. But I think at the same time, other parts of the world uh, are going to be able to actually impose their interpretations of history on their domestic populations and influence other populations. Yeah. And and that's one of the takeaways in the book is that the world of today comprises of lots of conflicting post-imperial narratives mm. uh, that, that don't match up because everyone's got a different interpretation about the rights and the wrongs of the past. Yeah, that's wonderful. I mean, again, as you were talking, I mean, the, the World Cup is on right now uh, and, and I have no doubt you're probably following it as well. Uh, when this uh, airs, it'll probably be finished. But, you know, we're seeing that reflected, uh, what you said about, you know, democracies embracing and, and, and refreshing, or certainly the, the European democracies refreshing their idea of themselves. Uh, just in the, in, the, uh, in the number of players uh, that are of various ethnic minorities in a particular given country, uh, and uh, certainly in, in, in Britain as well. Uh, and I think that's that, that's a key determining feature from the kind of nations that you've mentioned, you know, China, uh, Russia, Turkey, where the those who belong and who are part of the national identity uh, is is a lot lot clearer defined by uh, uh, as it seems, uh, whereas in some of the Western nations, uh, and I think that's. That's also been one of the wedges that countries like Russia, countries like China have tried to exploit uh, and target through, you know, even just through social media to create tensions, create divisions. Yeah. What's your thoughts on that? I mean, is that the, have you noticed that? Have you dabbled into any of, yeah. the, of that research? So I, this is the first World Cup I've struggled to watch because in Singapore, the matches are often <laughs> kicking off like after midnight. Yeah, awkward, it's awkward really, times, yeah. With the best one in the world, uh, it's hard to quite quite follow it. Yeah. But on those the wider themes, you'll, you'll sort of get a sense here that with the Imperial Hangover book, you know, there, there are imperial legacies that affect nations domestically, and then there are imperial legacies that affect nations at the international level. And they're quite closely interrelated. Certainly the composition of the French or or, Brit- or English football teams, they are sort of a living testimony, living, breathing testimony mm. to the imperial histories yeah. of those countries. And you know, whether it's North African players or players of North African origin, should I say, in the French team. Uh, and again, from Britain, you've got mm. uh, plenty of people with Caribbean and, and Afro-Caribbean backgrounds. You know, that's the reason their families probably ended up in the UK mm. 50, mm. 80, 100 years ago. And on the other hand, you've got, I guess, more... More sort of civilizational, uh, civilizationally sort of defined states like certainly China. You, to be Chinese, you tend to have to be Han Chinese. Mm. Ethnic diversity doesn't really work uh, at all in in those sorts of contexts in the way it does in the West. But there is also something about the style of empire uh, that then actually uh, contributes to population composition. So the British and the French, the Dutch, the Belgians, they had maritime colonial empires, which meant mm. that they they straddled different continents. Uh, and that also meant that when it, the empires ended, there's actually oceans and seas to separate them. Mm. Whether it's the Mediterranean between France and Algeria, whether it's you know two oceans between yeah. India and the United Kingdom, that's very different to conquest through adjacency, yeah. which is the, the mode of expansion that land empires tend to pursue, Russian, Ottoman, and others. Yeah. Uh, also, a couple of big implications there: one for ethnic diversity. The diversity is likely to be of adjacent populations in these countries. Russia is a living testament to mm. this. So is China. The other is that when the empire collapses, there's no there's no ability to separate oneself mm. in perpetuity, and one only needs to think of uh, you know whether it's the Balkans and how it still has you know uh, sort of legacies of of Russian, Hungarian, Ottoman, and other other empires, and they're still very proximate geographically. Mm. They're not that far away. Mm. Obviously, Russia, Ukraine, it's, you know, they're right next to each other. Mm. That's one of the big differences. And that's why I think going into studying the different types of empires, different ways they've ended, and the different ways in which uh, they've affected population compositions and relations between the successor states of these empires, 
uh, you know, I think is, is a very worthwhile endeavor if you want yeah. to understand the world today. Yeah, that's wonderful. And, and perhaps a good pivot also then to uh, Russia's road to war with Ukraine, uh, your second book or the second book uh, that we talked about today. Perhaps it's a good place to start to give our audience a, a bit of a reflection as to what the role and significance of Ukraine is in Imperial Russia, because I think that's, again, something that's broadly misunderstood, and perhaps it's a good uh, launching platform for us to, to dive a little bit deeper into where we are now. Absolutely. Uh, so the thing about Ukraine is it was the Soviet Socialist Republic, above any other, that was core to certainly the Soviet identification uh, with its empire. And I think with without Ukraine, the USSR was always always going to collapse. Actually, it was Ukraine's departure or desire to become fully independent in the early 1990s. That was one of the final nails in the coffin of the idea of the USSR. So why is it so central? The reason is a mixture of economic and cultural. And as somebody who, who, myself, I've worked in in every bit of Ukraine. Well, not quite every bit. Mm -hmm. I've been to Lviv. I've been to Donetsk. They're very far away. Let's put it this way, Mm -hmm. west Mm -hmm. to east. You know, I've been to the centre. I've been to the south. I've been to the north. It's a very varied country, but one of the things that is is unmistakable is the fact that the Russian Empire has deeply shaped the patterns of economic life uh, in Ukraine over many centuries. So the metallurgical industry, the mining industry in the east is is an outcome of what was the Russian Tsarist Empire's Industrial Revolution. That then sort of gave way to the discovery of, of oil and gas. Uh, and, uh, and in the later sort of Soviet period, Ukraine became a transit route mm. for the oil and gas that Europeans, as we know from our newspapers, have mm. been mm. Uh, basically heating their homes and, and powering their vehicles and factories. So, um, you know, there are many other parts of economic interdependence as well, like uh, rocketry and missiles, mm. uh, the defense industry, all the rest of it. Uh, there was a quite an intermingled Russian imperial uh, uh, sort of economic arrangement between what we now see as the Russian Federation and the territory of Ukraine. Uh, that's created some issues. That's also, uh, I think, gone hand in hand with the facts I mentioned earlier. Lots of Russian speakers, lots of Russians resettled, especially to East Ukraine, since the kind of 18th century onwards to run these, these endeavors. And that's typical in empires is that mm. you don't create jobs for the locals. You may create sort of slave jobs for the locals, but you basically populate uh, the sort of the better jobs with settlers that you mm. send out to represent your own kith and kin. And none of this justifies Russia's desire to, to hang on to Ukraine, but it, I think helps to explain where some of the psychological hang-ups have appeared, certainly mm. within Putin, but not only Putin, mm. within a whole bunch of Russians at the elite level, uh, opinion formers, people like Alexander Dugin, who's become a bit more famous after his daughter was assassinated yeah. in the car bomb. I sort of quote him in both my books, actually, uh, his translated work on sort of conceptualizing what Russian empire means in the present day. But people like Dugin and, and Putin, they both convey the obvious point is that the imperial collapse is only 31 now years ago mm-hmm. of the USSR. It's well within living memory. And that's something, again, that is another factor around imperial legacies is proximity to them. Never believe, by the way, anyone who says in, in a British context why are you non-white Brits complaining about uh, the British Empire? Do you see me complaining about being enslaved by the Romans? Uh, and yes, okay, the Romans did occupy mm. Britannia, as it was, you know, nearly 2,000 years ago. Mm. But I'm sorry, when it comes to imperial legacies, proximity to history matters massively. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Within living memory is is obviously the most proximate, but also within generational memory, as in my parents experienced this, yeah. matters too. That's where the hang-ups come from. That's where the sort of the messy populations being separated from each other also comes from as well. And mm. it's also the moment of maximum peril is uh, that period in sort of the the twilight of empire and just after it, where uh, you realize that there are scores to be settled. There are people who felt that uh, the way that the empire ended did not reflect, uh, you know, the right vision for that particular territory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And another point that stands out there is the proximity to history. That's also the more proximate, the easier it can be flamed uh, and the easier it can serve as as fuel for segregation division uh, because it's 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 so close it's so close that you know it's within living memory uh, that it can inflame people uh, is that something yeah, that you've just very quickly yeah, on that yeah, yeah, no one ever told me in britain uh, to uh, you know cite the roman empire 
uh, as a as a point of of anger towards Italians today mm, in an yeah. England Italian football match. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter. It yeah. has zero emotional traction. Yeah. Sure, the Celts, the descendants of you know the forebears of some people in Britain today, you know, were subjugated by the Romans. But it doesn't matter. Yeah. What matters is, and actually, there is not a formula, but something I do look at in the book. Four generations is roughly where I think something from history slips from memory to memorialization. Mm. And when it moves to memorialization, mm. you actively have to sustain memory of it yeah. through sort of cultural events and, you know, trying to reconstruct things because no one actually can relate to those sorts yeah. of situations That's today who are still alive. That's really interesting. I mean, because I've heard it said so many times, uh, including in my own household, that, you know, had, uh, had Tito's legacy in Yugoslavia survived one more generation, uh, we wouldn't have had what we had. Uh, and that I think speaks to that point because there was still, there were still people, uh, in the nineties who had a living memory of what had happened, uh, in World War II, uh, between the, uh, various, pa- various, uh, ethnic groups. So I'm not sure how long, you know, how many years four generations is. I, I, I don't know what the kind of measuring yardstick is for a generation. I'm guessing probably 20, 30 years. Yeah. Uh, so that kind of, uh, that makes sense, uh, because it was, it was close enough yeah. in living memory. Yeah. Let me just illustrate that really mm. tangibly for everyone mm. and mm. through the figure of the recent departed Queen Elizabeth II, mm. Mm. who uh, pretty much spanned about those four generations, dying at, in her 90s, being born, I think, 19, in the 1920s. Uh, her passing is is a very, very interesting, I think, marker mm. around the passage away from the high era of Western colonial domination mm. around the world. Mm. And she basically, uh, Queen Victoria, of course, presided over the expansion of the British Empire to yeah. its apex, as all Australians will know for a fact. You know, that, that Victorian yeah, era yeah, is, is actually the dominant kind of shaping yeah. uh, reality for probably for lots of cultural uh, and sort of historical memories in Australia, ways of doing things, certainly in Britain, mm. Queen Elizabeth II presided over uh, the dismantling of the empire. Mm. And, and that's, that's I think, one of the ways to, to understand how quickly the world has changed. Yeah. She was removed as head of state from one of the Caribbean countries because they want to become a republic quite recently. And that's, again, another little stark indicator of how the world is is becoming much more aware, at least when it comes to Western imperial legacies, and not challenging them, but just not buying the kind of the benign, this is all in the name of, of everyone's advantage and advancement. And that's the readjustment. Mm. It's not that the West is morally evil in a way no one else is. Not at all. By far, the Russians are more you know, barbaric than anything the West is doing right now. Mm. But it's just that ability to readjust and to be nimble in your self-awareness and your presentation to the rest of the world. If the Western world wants to meaningfully compete uh, with the other centers of power that are emerging. Yeah, and compete is the right word, I guess. Uh, compete, compete. and. Uh, in fact, let me ask you this. What are we competing for? Fabulous question. <laughs> so the, the great phrase now, we had the great global war on terror, mm. which was, you know, my my six or seven years in the UK foreign office. That was a framework around which national security discourse in the West policymaking was sort of focused around, obviously, Iraq, mm. Afghanistan, mm. 9-11. Mm. Now we have great power contest. And isn't that interesting that uh, we've got another new catchphrase and, you know, mm. You always need the marketing, I think, to be able to focus minds, yeah, uh, with, both within your population as well as your policy making and national security communities. What are we competing for? Great question. Ultimately, what we're competing for is the ability to be a gatekeeper in the world at large, mm. an arbiter of right and wrong, of, of the sort of the grantor of permission to actions outside of our borders. That is ultimately a, quite a, an art, you know, abstract way of defining global mm. influence. Mm. But because we don't live in a world of conquest, you know, the West is not going to go and conquer somewhere else. It's going to look to preserve its influence around the world. It's going to look to preserve its power to intervene, to prevent things from happening. But, you know, that's again where I think uh, the sort of the the means end up taking over from the ends because the means then become a way in which you organize your economic and sort of philosophical discussions and arrangements mm. and I, I sort of say economic and philosophical because it's economic because that's how you spend your money it's how you position military forces around the world it's where you look to invest it's where you look to attract business where you attract foreign students to a mm. university mm. all these mm. things mm. to build those global connections to look like you're a global influencer but it's also philosophical because it has to be a, a guiding principle behind why you're bothering to do this why bother to do this yeah. And again, I think this is very fertile territory to to explore because we're going to be exploring this, whether we like it or not, for the rest of our lifetimes as this readjustment occurs, where the world becomes 
uh, less Western, less, less monoculturally Western influenced, I think mm, is fair mm. to say. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess that's, uh, that's also a, a narrative that we hear quite a lot coming out of the Kremlin as well, in the sense that, you know, the end of a unipolar world, uh, is over and that we find ourselves in a multipolar world, which, you know, in many ways, and there I agree with the Kremlin on anything, uh, is, is absolutely true. And, and going by what you're saying is also very true, uh, which is why Ukraine is a particularly interesting case study right now. And I think you, you, you rightly point out in your book loud and clear, uh, that Putin's war cannot be justified, you know, and that there's nothing that NATO or Ukraine might have done in the past or, or at any point uh, along this journey that would justify what he's doing now. So I just want to emphasize that again, loud and clear. Yeah. But you do also place some blame on NATO and the US in particular, and their less than ideal approach to Ukraine. And I find this a really fascinating thread in the book. What did you mean by that? Yeah. Thanks for providing that that caveat, because that is absolutely it. I mean, this is a heinous war. And, you know, having lived in Donbass myself, I've got you know, friends who are suffering. Actually, one of the best things I did with the book was I, I got a couple of the interpreters who worked with us in the OSC mission in eastern yeah. Ukraine. They're Donbass, Donetsk natives. They've both fled, funnily enough, uh, out, out of Ukraine. Uh, I gave them a bit of translation work for the book. Yeah. And it was really nice to re-engage with them. And, you know, so that to the extent it can be someone who's not there right now. That's right. I have spent a to lot connect, of time yeah. trying to think about how heinous and horrible this is for Ukrainians. And that mm. is, again, one of the sort of the, the book is written in that spirit. It is, yeah. But because it's written with the, the, the price that Ukrainians are paying as a foremost thought in my mind, I want to see how Ukraine was let down. Yes. Yeah. by yeah. the big empire-like structures that are to its east and to its west. And historically, Ukrainian leaders, most of the leaders, by the way, who adorn the Hrivna banknotes, I won't go into the deep history here, and Sergei Plochy, the Ukrainian-American writer, is very good on the detail, and I draw on his book. Mm. Uh, Ukrainian uh, leaders in the past have had to side with one empire or another. And sometimes they sided with the Russians against the Swedes and the Poles. Other times mm -hmm. they tried to side with the Poles against the Russians. And now they have a uh, sort of a revanchist imperialist Russia, and they have an expanding NATO alliance. Now, I'm not saying there's any equivalence between the two, but obviously the Ukrainians have had to play either a middle, sort of a drive in the middle lane without being sort of pulled into either verge or have very much tried to move from one from the middle lane to one side. And mm. Actually, Ukraine's political decisions have oscillated around this. And we should remind ourselves that although Viktor Yanukovych, who was ousted in the Maidan Revolution, uh, was corrupt, he was you know, open to Kremlin influence, he was also legally elected in 2010. And mm. as someone who's been an election observer in Ukraine, I can point to the fact that the international monitors in 2010, I wasn't there in that year, mm -hmm. pointed out that Yanukovych was legally elected. He mm. had a soft message with regards to Russia. He didn't have much enthusiasm to join NATO. He had some more enthusiasm to join the EU. But the tragedy of Ukraine's politics in sort of the 10, 15 year stretch that I focus on in detail yeah. is the descent of mutual exclusivity in its foreign policy choices. It cannot be in both the Russian and the NATO camp. Yeah. It has made bids in the past to join NATO. It's been let down. You know, there are documents that I've found, that, you know, they're not difficult to find that show US policymakers in the past encouraging Ukraine's NATO bid. Yeah. Uh, and there are steps NATO directly took in enhancing its cooperation with Ukraine that have obviously been misunderstood and miscalculated by the Kremlin as a path to full membership. Mm. Now, I'm not making a moral judgment over Ukraine's uh, you know, right to join NATO or not. I'm making a practical judgment as someone who worked in diplomacy in the past. The signalling of these moves to tighten uh, your grip with NATO, the cost that that then rises for Ukraine's insecurity, because they will never get NATO collective defence. Biden ruled that out from day one of this invasion in February 2022. Mm. We will not fight in Ukraine, we'll fight to defend NATO territory, which is obviously outside, mm. but the moves to cultivate the relationship with NATO and try to join one day have angered the Russians. Yeah. And given Putin, what he thinks, are a grounding, not to justify the invasion, but I always say it's not provocation or justification, it's motivation. What's motivating him to do this other than his own pathologies? 
it's this move of Ukraine to the Western camp. Last observation on this. I don't think Ukraine, for its territoriality to be guaranteed and sovereignty to be protected before this invasion, it could either exclusively be in the Western or the Russian camp. Mm. In like a fairy tale land where everything is lovely, it should have been a bridge between East and West, in which it's the influences of the you know, Polish uh, and Austro-Hungarian empires of the past are very prevalent in Lviv. The influence of Russia and Russian empires are very prevalent in Donetsk. Mm-hmm. And somehow, Kiev's political leadership was able to maintain favourable connections with both East and West. That's a fairy tale. Hard reality of geopolitics is that Ukraine was both encouraged and felt the need to make mutually exclusive choices in its foreign policy and security arrangements. Mm. And that's one of the other ways we need to understand why war has come to Ukraine. As well as Putin's nasty, evil, and a Hitler for the 21st century. Sure, you, but you just need Twitter to see that. You yeah. Look at your memes, look at your own sort of moral compass, it's heinous. But the structural reasons and the post-imperial reasons around why Ukraine is and will be a war zone for the foreseeable future of Ukraine's are suffering come down to foreign policy choices when you are located next to a pair of beer moths. NATO and Russia. Yeah, and I think you you talk about the dangling of the carrot quite a lot, and and that's that's again something that is not really discussed because there you mention it that there was there's been a carrot dangled to Ukraine both from the EU as well as NATO. You know, if you accept that as a truth or or explore the truth of that uh, through the evolution of this, I guess, crisis and problem since uh, the the fall of the Soviet Union, you face the risk again of being thrown into the kind of Putinist camp. Uh, or the yeah. anti-Ukraine, uh, anti-NATO camp, uh, which is something I've experienced myself, and I have no doubt you have experienced, uh, given the fact that you are, you know, critical uh, of, of, of certain, uh, particularly U.S. policy, where you know you quote uh, some uh, some some rather colourful language uh, of certain American diplomats uh, as to who's going to be ruling Ukraine uh, and that uh, and who will be deciding that. Can you explore that a little bit more, uh, a little bit more detail? Because again, I think that's something that's 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 oftentimes missed. Yeah. This this dangling of this carrot that it was never that yeah. was always too far. Uh, it was always yeah. too far for Ukraine. So Ukraine has a right to join NATO and the EU. I'm not saying it doesn't, but I'm looking at the consequences of of trying to join both, failing and leaving yourself exposed. That's all I'm looking at. Yeah. And that's the story of the last 15, 20 years. With regards to the US, this is one of the things that the war on terror, I think, has probably made us forget is actually George W. Bush's administration, as well as invading Iraq and, and occupying Afghanistan to no real end in either place, uh, was also heavily ideological in Eastern Europe. And I can see why George W. was probably carrying on the legacy of his father in helping democracy to be fostered in parts of Eastern Europe. Mm. Now, the question was, how far was too far? And I don't think there's a problem with NATO expansion, EU expansion. I don't think there's any problem with Poland and others. There's an issue, though, that Ukraine, as we've talked about in the past, Mm. was perceived culturally and economically as very close to Russia's historical experience. It's a very patronising, condescending perception in Russia, perhaps. But that was part of the material reality. When you look back, especially at Dick Cheney's language in 2008, and I quote one of his speeches, it's bonkers in Mm. terms of NATO has the right to expand into Ukraine and Georgia, kind of try stop us kind of language. Like, come on. Now, what's changed is that in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, the US unipolarity was undisputed. This goes back to one of our early themes. It is now somewhat disputed, if not utterly disputed in some parts of the world. And what the US hasn't done, certainly publicly, is maybe it's doing it privately, is update its assumptions about democratization and NATO expansion mm. into uh, sort of Eastern Europe uh, that were held in the 90s and the early 2000s. And I quote work by, you know, speeches by Madeleine Albright and Stroke Talbot around the wisdom of NATO expansion. There's a great book by a Johns Hopkins professor called Mary Surratt called Not One Inch, mm. which talks about NATO expansion in the 90s. So there's a lot of scholarly work and, and documentary work that I can draw on uh, to, to look at these themes. And, and, you know, I encourage the reader to form their own conclusions. Yeah, that's right. But ultimately... Was it responsible to encourage NATO expansion with regards to Ukraine when the actual dynamics of the alliance politically meant that consensus to admit Ukraine was always elusive? Were there better arrangements in sort of a hypothetical sense uh, that for Eastern Europe's political and security arrangements 
especially in the sort of the early post-Cold War period, the 90s and the early 2000s, that would have better guaranteed Ukraine's security? Or was there just an inevitability that Putin is a monster and he's about to invade? Mm. I don't think there was any inevitability in what's happened in 2022. I think the situation for Ukraine decayed Mm. quite worryingly and quite, you know, quite gradually over about 15 or 20 years in terms Mm. of the viability Mm. of its own ability to protect itself. Just a final point on this. Mm. There are a lot of people, a lot of people who have been killed, maimed and traumatized by this war. And again, that is what I think about. It's not about the rights and wrongs of could you join NATO or the EU? The fact of the matter is there are now tens of thousands of people dead. There are hundreds of thousands of people injured on both the Russian and Ukrainian side. It is a catastrophe for, for a generation. Mm, yeah. in these countries yeah, yeah. Uh, and that is that is a horrible horrible situation i think to for ukraine to be coming out of this when even if it quote unquote wins it will be devastated yeah. by this war materially and in population terms let alone psychologically yeah. and this is a catastrophe and what we should understand in the round the structural conditions as to how this catastrophe should occur and not just begin and end with Putin's evil. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a catastrophe for one, but a legacy for at least four, as you rightly pointed out. Uh, and I think that's also important to remember that although this war will end at some point, its legacy will be felt by a number of generations because it will be passed on, the narratives will be passed on. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, earlier what motivates Putin, but what has motivated the US uh, in particular, but NATO more broadly, to perpetuate this uh, NATO expansion? Yeah, so NATO expansion is, you know, it's not the singular focus of the book. And and to the extent that uh, one can discern, NATO was not abolished at the end of the Cold War mm. as a hedge against the possible, I guess, rearmament and, and return of Russia. You could argue that NATO expansion perpetuated this. You could argue NATO expansion was a sensible hedge against this. Mm, mm. Honestly, you could probably divide the world's population in two on this. And I'm not going to try and resolve that debate, that dispute, because ultimately, believe it or not, I think NATO expansion is a bit like a piece of abstract art. You can see in it what you want. Mm, you can mm. see in it all the world's evil. Well, what you fits, yeah. The, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, the sort of the guarantee of, of you know, the protection of, of uh, certainly my country, the UK, and, and others who've joined it. Now, what I'd say is this. NATO is perceived differently outside of the sort of the broad US alliance structure that also includes countries like Australia and Japan and others than it is inside of that structure. Mm. And I think there's Mm. a warm, fuzzy, benign presentation of what NATO is. It's a defensive alliance. It's a voluntary club. Then there's all the op-eds written in sort of the outside the Western world and outside the structure of the Western world are saying, well, NATO ran a sort of ineffectual occupation of Afghanistan for a very long period of time. It was the enabling vehicle for offensive action and regime change in Libya how can you say it's a defensive alliance? Uh, and and again, like it's it's too complex uh, an entity to be able to, I think, come to a singular judgment with regards to. But in terms of what's motivating NATO expansion, I think part of it is is inertia. Mm. Part of it mm-hmm. is uh, the feeling that for the Western world, it's been a very effective tool of guaranteeing uh, American integration to European defence arrangements. What I think we will we will have to face is. Some of Donald Trump's arguments around the Europeans paying for their own defence uh, are not going to go away. Ukraine war has exacerbated, I uh, think, tensions around how Germany's self-perception and outside perception within the West uh, is unsustainable as as a country that is now moving beyond its own historical legacies of of the World War Two era. Mm, mm. And that slips outside of living memory to basically paying more for Europe's defence. Yeah. But there is no military culture in Germany now to really have that uh, have that being built upon. Uh, we may see, I think, NATO evolve very dramatically in the future, very simply on the basis of European self-sufficiency around defence. If that happens, NATO may then, I think, reduce in its significance to being the enabler for joint Euro-American military action when that's required, mm. as well as the ultimate collective guarantee for European security under the US the nuclear umbrella. But I think right now, NATO appears to be far more important because of the fact that there is a deficiency in Europe's own ability to defend itself. Mm. Uh, and yeah. and obviously Putin's invasion means that more countries want to join NATO. So you know the very expansion he wanted to prevent is is happening. But the last point on this: the very expansion he wanted to prevent is actually really Ukraine's and Georgia's memberships mm. of NATO. I'm sure he's annoyed that you know Sweden and, and, and Finland want to join, but that that is not as core to Putin's uh, understanding of Russia's rights to be a great power. 
in some respects, you'll think, well, so what? They're already very tightly integrated into NATO. Mm. What I think Putin is going to try to do is to turn uh, the Russia's veto vote against Ukraine's foreign policy direction into a generational undertaking for right, future Russian policymakers. And how he does that, I don't know. But there, I don't think there'll be any let up in this idea that Ukraine is free to make its choices in its intact form. I think mm. the Russians mm. continually find ways to prevent that from being the case. Okay. And, uh, well, taking that one step further and also, in a way, taking this conversation towards its uh, end, what do you see then as the most efficient and perhaps the least destructive and, most importantly, the most enduring path to peace? Well, so one thing that uh, Ukraine is still going to do is it's still going to fight to recapture territory. Mm. And I think the most enduring path to peace is understanding at which point its ability to retake territory becomes too costly and too difficult to continually support from the outside. Because ultimately, mm. Ukraine's war effort is foreign funded, yeah. foreign armed. Understandably, their economy is wrecked and they will have probably gone through all their ammunition stocks at a rate that I think military analysts, mm. really detailed military analysts, are now amazed, I think, at, well, God, you need to stockpile this much 155, mm. this mm. much 7.62 millimeter bullets, ammunition just on the number of weeks of high intensity conventional warfare, because we haven't seen this kind of yeah. conventional warfare yeah. in so long. So yeah, there is a continual need to support Ukraine to do this, but there's a point to make a judgment around when the costs start to exceed the benefits for Ukraine as well as, as well as for, for those who are backing Ukraine. When that happens, sadly, the thing that is, is, you know, always cancelled on Twitter, which is negotiation, will actually have to return because there will have to be some kind of negotiated uh, path to ending this conflict. What that means in practical terms, I think, is, and I mentioned Cyprus earlier, I think de facto, not de jure partition. Mm -hmm. uh, Ukraine may never recognize the fact that it's lost Crimea and parts of the Donbass. Uh, but I think the idea that Ukraine's going to campaign into Crimea, military is going to campaign into where I was previously living in Don. Donetsk yeah. City, mm. when those those places have been under Russian occupation now for you know, coming to a decade, yeah. Russian possession uh, in Ukraine, in Crimea's case for you know for, for eight nine years, I think is is slightly fanciful, mm. uh, and I think what we may find is that Zelensky goes from being hero to anti-hero within some Ukrainian constituencies because he's selling out the country. So Zelensky now has got a, a domestic uh, rationale to continue the war because he'll always look like he's resisting yeah. uh, the Russians. Yeah. But perpetual war at this intensity of 2022 is not possible. Mm. Uh, it's too high tempo. So we might see a trailing off of the conflicts. We might see it just it petering out without any formal negotiations. Then again, we might actually see negotiations uh, and I think those are the only paths that we can expect 2023 to to lead. Uh, enduring, if there, if asked to design an enduring uh, settlement, I would actually pick Cyprus as my model because there are some diplomatic fudges around uh, sovereignty and territoriality that have basically recognised the 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 partially successful Turkish invasion because mm. Russians aren't going to go anywhere. They're going to build military bases. They're going to occupy mm. the parts mm. of Ukraine that they mm. occupy, uh, and they're going to fight hard to keep them. Yeah, um, it doesn't mean we have to give in to that, but at some point those ground realities will start to take over. And the population has been homogenized in many ways. I mean, the ethnic cleansing in all its forms uh, has certainly taken shape yeah. across those various occupied parts, um, and that that will take uh, its toll as well. Uh, my last question, and staying with the theme, I guess, of empires, what lessons can we draw? What lessons can the West draw from what we're seeing unfold in Ukraine? Uh, when it comes time to talk about and think about China and China's yeah. own imperial desires, uh, wishes, or maybe maybe not imperial, but post-imperial desires, um, how, how, what can we learn? I think we need to apply our lessons very carefully. And again, that's another part of the Imperial Hangover book is to say, let's not draw casual analogies that, that look nice on tweets and op-eds. Mm. Uh, let's look at the imperial experience of these major countries for their own sake and understand how the legacies are always different. The one comparison is more structural about the world, and that's that there are historical grievances that countries would not have been empowered to pursue in the era of undisputed US hegemony that they may feel they're a little bit more empowered to do now. Uh, and China, certainly with regards to Taiwan, and, and also in its own way, albeit domestically with Hong Kong and suppression of the protests, mm. that's an expression of injustices that the Chinese leadership and dominant Chinese narratives 
like to tell themselves around things around the opium wars, things around Western colonization, things around wars with the Japanese empire in the past. Forget Taiwan was a Japanese colony mm. uh, between 1895, 1945. Mm. The lesson is, is about different historical narratives powering countries through these choices in ways that cannot be influenced by Western historical narratives. Mm. The practical lessons of when there's an invasion, you know, what kind of invasion, there are no lessons because the Chinese will draw their own conclusions about a very unique set of circumstances around Taiwan, around maritime power uh, versus land power, because of course there's the Taiwan Strait. It's not very large, but it separates mainland China from Taiwan. Um, The other lesson I think that we need to really keep in mind is this lesson of conflicting post imperial narrative so whenever the western world will try to censor what china says about its activities regarding hong kong or taiwan the chinese will come back and they'll point out things that the west has done Mm, in the past and i'm not picking sides on that but to give you one very quick example of course the british government was livid over the repression of protests in hong kong two years ago china's ambassador to the uk in london pointed out that there were no free elections in the crown colony of hong kong until Mm. the very very end and, you know, I'm not saying that that is, that is an argument to take at face value. It's just propaganda. Mm. But the comebacks, yeah. you know, the pushbacks, they're all there. Yeah. And, you know, you'll, you'll hear things like, you know, Japan is going to help defend Taiwan against the Chinese. You'll hear things like, well, Japan is an occupied country because the Americans have got how many hundreds of thousands of personnel <laughs> yeah. in Okinawa. Yeah. You'll hear yeah. these things in which, yeah. you know, which you would never have heard. You know, in a sort of a strong way, 50 years ago, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, in a way that would actually challenge, uh, you know, these sorts of these sorts of disputes. Sure, in the Cold War, there was a lot of this uh, going around. But I think now, now we've got a, a real sense that the rise of China will empower not only China, but other countries. And Putin's invasion of Ukraine has been dramatically influenced by his assessment of the world moving to a more Asian-centric mm. space. Mm. He's buttressed his economy against Western sanctions by trading more with India, trading more with China. Mm-hmm. That is another one of the big lessons that we've got, is that when the West uses sanctions, when the West militarily backs uh, the wrong party, the challenger to the West will find ways around workarounds uh, that maybe didn't exist in, in such a way, you know, in, in past decades. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, it's somewhat scary. Uh, maybe a second last question. Sure. Yeah. What makes you lose sleep at night? Given everything we've talked about, yeah. um, I feel like that's a really important question to ask somebody like you who's devoted so much of their professional career, uh, and cognitive power to understanding geopolitics at a much kind of at a macro level. Uh, so what, 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 what do you sleep? What do you lose sleep over? Quite literally, uh, this year, it was the initial bit of the Russian invasion. I mean, I found it. I mean, when you see cities that you used to live in being pummeled mm. and people, you know, writing on Facebook about fleeing, mm. oh man, I, I, as much as an outsider could, I really felt like mm. you know, somewhat traumatized by yeah. this, albeit you're on the other side of the world. And I think the time difference meant I was sort of staying up on healthy hours, watching whether the Ukrainians would lose Kiev. Uh, that was yeah. the big thing yeah. that literally made me lose sleep. Yeah. I think a uh, sort of a more general level, what I think concerns me the most is how to find spaces to articulate these themes without being accused of being a sympathizer for the wrong side. That I think is, is actually quite troubling. Mm. Uh, and I think, you know, you can like democracies all you want. You can hate the Russians and the Chinese for all they're worth. But ultimately, uh, this great grand global readjustment that's happening means that we need to be able to articulate middle ground perspectives, compromise perspectives, coexistence perspectives. And what makes me lose sleep is even in our democracies, there are concerted efforts to close down our spaces to have these conversations. That's, I think, the biggest concern I have at the moment. Here, here. And as a podcaster who's trying to walk that middle ground, I, uh, geez, I can't agree enough. Um, yeah, on that note, Sami, uh, I knew always, uh, having read both your books, uh, and, and again, uh, I said this to you at the start and, and before we started recording, you have done a remarkable job, I think, bridging such a dense subject of empire to a lay audience, which is what I am. Uh, I'm not a historian. I haven't studied empires uh, to this extent ever, uh, but I'm enriched by having read both your books. It's given me so much more 
context and so much more ammunition uh, to explore these subjects with a little bit more nuance uh, than I have previously. So I thank you for writing them, and I certainly encourage um, my audience uh, to have a look at them. Uh, certainly worth the read. Uh, but on that note, thank you very much. I, uh, I know I've taken up a lot of your time, so uh, thank you very much. Hey, listen, Maz, thank you so much. What a great conversation, and you're, you're too kind of writing the books. You know, really, please do pick them up, and they are there to allow you to form your own informed decisions about the world, exactly as you're saying. And I'm so glad that you took out from them, especially the Hangover book, uh, exactly what it was intended to do, to give you that historical context. So when you're next scrolling through the news, you kind of understand the bit that they don't tell you in the news, mm. which is mm. where history has led to these disputes, these misunderstandings, these conflicts. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Voices of War. And since you got this far, please take a moment to like and review the show wherever you get your pods. Thank you, and until the next time.